At what point were you pretty certain that you were going to Southeast Asia, that you were going to a real fight? As soon as I saw orders to F-4 Phantoms, I knew that, and particularly since I was going to the West Coast, we knew that we would be taking part in the Vietnam conflict. In aviation terms, Konstantin Kalinin's K-7 was a classic exercise of early 1930s giantism, a massive aircraft for the time. And indeed for years to come, it was destined to break much new ground and many hearts during its relatively short career. Despite the K-7's massive 175-foot wingspan, which was almost twice the aircraft's length, it was not particularly hard to fly or even to handle. This was due to the fact that it employed a servo tab system on the control surfaces. These allowed the moving surfaces to be literally flown into position with very little effort from the pilot. We were very interested in type of controls because they were servo tab controls. At least half of them were servo tab and half were, were the normal controls. They worked together and um, it offers a lot of um, advantages in lightening up the controls and it also, they are very much less liable to um, enemy fire. Uh, they're not as vulnerable. If you strike the controls, um, you don't uh, really put them out of action. You've got to put the small tab out of action. And uh, that's a, a very different cup of tea. For all that, the K-7, even with its seven engines, was not the largest winged aircraft ever built. That distinction was still to be held by the German Dornier Doax flying boat, which was first flown in 1929. This behemoth aircraft was actually powered by no less than 12 engines and carried passengers who enjoyed unparalleled luxury. Three Doaxes were built and flew with relatively few mishaps, although they were never really practical or economically viable. However, also in 1929, another German manufacturer, Junkers, offered its G38. Two were built, and like the K7 that followed, they were giant land planes, but not as large as the Doe X. The G38s were nevertheless big, and they also shared something else with K7. Both aircraft were more or less flying wings, with a limited fuselage, purely to support the tailplane for added stability. With both the K-7 and the G-38, nearly all the aircraft's vital components were placed in their massive wings. The K-7 wing was particularly interesting, as Kalinin chose an elliptical shape, similar to that later employed on the British Spitfire, the American Thunderbolt, and some German Heinkel designs. Elliptical wings, although more difficult to make, have some aerodynamic advantages. The K-7 would have had the largest elliptical wings ever made. Kalinin's vision for the K-7 was that there should be three different versions. First, the heavy bomber. This concept would rely upon tremendous defensive fire. The two narrow booms that supported the tail would each house gunners, who would be able to reach their positions with the aid of their own powered trolleys connected to the main wing. There were also many other gun positions. The K-7 bristled with machine guns and cannons. There were even gun positions in each of the enormous pontoons that also housed the undercarriage. Kalinin also foresaw the K-7 as a giant military transport which could carry large numbers of troops and other heavy loads that might even include light tanks, a capability that Soviet military planners had long been interested in. Finally, the K-7 was also seen as a luxury airliner, a passenger plane to challenge even the opulence of the Doe X in the exact opposite of what the proletariat revolution was supposed to have been all about. 
However, if Kalinin's ambition could see no limits to what might be done, a small group of Soviet planners were starting to rethink what had been done. 1933, the year that K-7 first flew, was also the year that the Nazi party came to power in Germany. Now there were two large dictatorships, fascism and communism, both looking to influence Europe with their own dogma for a new world order. And both were highly militaristic. However, there were differences in the needs and thinking of the two powers. Germany would ultimately turn to using larger numbers of two-engine bombers, and in contrast, the Soviets having to contemplate much greater distances could see the need for a larger four-engined aircraft, although nothing like the size or cost of Kalinin's K-7. Soviet planners started to look more closely at a simpler design that they already had. The TB-3 from the Tupolev Bureau was much smaller than the K-7, with an all-up weight of about half of Kalinin's design. True, it had none of the sophistication of the K-7, However, it was a proven concept, affordable, and most important, adaptable. Later versions even succeeded in towing a light tank fitted as a glider, the only time in history such a task was ever achieved. The TB-3 became a workhorse of the Soviet Army, and went on to provide years of valuable work long after its expected service life. About the time that the K-7 made its first flight, the United States Army was itself putting together specifications for another very heavy bomber under what would be known as Project A. The Boeing company was to be the successful contender with its Model 294, not quite as big as K-7, but still a very large aircraft indeed. Entering production, the 294 was given the service prefix XB-15. Only one example was ordered because the XB-15 was seen purely as a flying laboratory to test the pros and cons of giant aircraft. From concept to first flight, the project actually took over four years to complete. Such was the difficulty developing extra-large aircraft. A year after issuing specifications for the XB-15, the Army Air Corps released another requirement for a multi-engine bomber. Boeing, amongst other companies, were again given a contract to build prototypes. Boeing's XB-17 was flying within one year. By the end of 1945, over 12,700 fortresses had been built, and the Second World War come and gone. By contrast, only the one XB-15 was ever completed. However, it served its purpose. Both the US and the Soviets had adequately demonstrated that a large four-engine bomber could be a practical proposition, but not if it was too sophisticated or too complicated. The B-17 and TB-3 were basic and reliable. What happened to K-7? In November of 1933, during its 11th test flight, it crashed, the result of structural failure. Fifteen people died in the accident. Although the project did continue for a while, with two other prototypes commissioned, they were never finished. With the TB-3, and later the PE-8, Soviet planners established the need for large four-engine bombers, but not giants. Konstantin Kalinin went on to develop other ambitious aviation projects, including a pure flying wing and an advanced rocket plane. Sadly, Kalinin was arrested in 1938 and suffered the same fate as so many forward thinkers in Stalin's pre-war purge. You guys wouldn't tell me what this is all about. Well, look what we have right in here. You are a navigator, correct? Right. Well, we're getting ready to go fly, and, and our navigator called in sick today, so well, you, would, would you do us the honor of going flying with us today? You what, you, you're going to actually go flying? If you'll go. Well, sure I'll go. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, would you like Why to go not? along? I'll go. <laughs> yes. You want to go on a ride? Sure I do. <laughs>
Gary Sinise is known to most of us as Lieutenant Dan, the character he played in the Oscar-winning movie Forrest Gump, and as Mac Taylor, the lead character in the long-running TV series CSI New York. He is equally well known for his tireless support of our troops, veterans, and first responders. The tradition of service to our country runs long and deep in Gary's family. His uncle, Jack Sinise, flew 30 missions as a lead navigator in World War II. Gary's brother-in-law and close friend, Jack Treese, served 23 years in the U.S. Army, earning two bronze stars and two purple hearts. Jack served in Vietnam as a combat medic with the 101st Airborne Division. Sadly, both Jack Sinise and Jack Treese passed away this past October. General Patrick Brady knows firsthand the heroism of combat medics like Jack Trees. During two tours of duty as a medevac pilot in Vietnam, he flew more than 2,000 missions and rescued more than 5,000 wounded. For evacuating 51 wounded while having three helicopters shot out from under him on January 6, 1968, he was presented the Medal of Honor. In one of the most inspirational of all Warbirds in Review forums, General Brady and Gary Sinise will pay tribute to Jack Sinise, Jack Trees, and indeed all those veterans who risked all to defend us and to save their brothers and sisters in the field while the battle still raged. Providing a fitting backdrop for this presentation will be the Yankee Air Force's beautifully restored Yankee Lady, a B-17 much like the one in which Jack Sinise flew his 30 wartime missions. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, the 2015 Warbirds in Review. We have been doing these features uh, all week and they continue to get better and better every day. Uh, you might have figured out today that we're gonna feature a B-17. Is that a clue? We have a ramp full of airplane. There's not as much room for uh, people to actually sit around today, but that is uh, wonderful. The Yankee lady from the uh, Yankee Air Force uh, in uh, Ypsilanti uh, they brought their uh, airplane to be uh, a wonderful part of this presentation. The Huey is from Atlanta, Georgia. We uh, welcome all of those people and we appreciate them uh, making their airplanes uh, available to us. We appreciate, uh, you see the logo here, this is Scott's miracle Grow Company has made all of this possible, the media presence that you see here. In addition to the Fagan Fighters Museum in Granite Falls, Minnesota, they have the veterans coins that we'll be passing out to all of our veterans uh, after the presentation. Again, we thank them and uh, to our Jelly Belly uh, uh, sponsor. Uh, not only do we enjoy uh, their Jelly Belly candy, but uh, they are the ones who supported the Huey flying all the way up from Atlanta. Just as a matter of uh, interest to you, the fuel cost alone for uh, the Huey to come from Atlanta is about $7,000. So that, and we won't even talk about these four engines on this B-17, right? Uh, uh, that brings me to, there's a bomb hidden over here that our friend Jack Roush made for me that uh, is for donations. This is solely uh, supported uh, by the generous donations of uh, people such as Scott's, the Fagans, and uh, Jelly Belly. But uh, every dollar that you drop in that bomb, Jack promises me that when uh, you drop a dollar in, it will not blow up. So feel free to participate and uh, help us put this program on. Uh, we have the privilege of having David Hartman here throughout the week in uh, addition to a lot of other people that make this happen. But today's uh, presentation, Gary Sinise uh, had an Uncle Jack 
and his brother-in-law also served as a medic, so I will let them tell you more about that, but uh, we're honored to have David Hartman as our moderator, and as always, uh, you see the uh, talents of Sleeping Dog Productions flying on demand TV, and we're actually live right now. Uh, so we thank all of them for their talents sharing that with us, and Jim Kepnick, I see smiling back here. He is our still photographer. We've been doing photo missions every morning, the videos from all of this will be uh, available later on. Uh, I can't wait to see them myself. On behalf of uh, myself and the entire Warbirds of America, we thank you for uh, participating uh, in the events and making this the best place uh, to be at Oshkosh. Thanks. Thank you. It is such a privilege to be here to share with all of you um, uh, in honoring our veterans who have protected our freedoms for decades, our, our active duty personnel, and our civilians who restore these airplanes because they're committed to maintaining this history. We don't want any of us to be forgotten. So it's a privilege to be with you today. Thanks for joining us. Um, Gary Sinise, uh, uh, an Emmy, a uh, Golden Globe, uh, nomination for an Oscar, or just a few of his many professional uh, honors. Uh, of course, his Lieutenant Dan Band continues to make us uh, tap our feet and get up and dance in the aisles. They perform, by the way, tonight at 8 in the Boeing Plaza. That's 8 tonight. Uh, Gary, with his long commitment to honoring veterans, uh, created his foundation, the Gary Sneeze Foundation. His foundation serves our nation and honors our defenders our veterans, our first responders, there's families, in fact, anybody in need. He is national spokesperson for the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial and a recipient of the Presidential Citizen Medal for his humanitarian work supporting Iraqi children. Welcome, Gary Sinise. Thank you. Now welcome Medal of Honor recipient, General Patrick Brady. <laughs> Gary, tell us about Jack Treese, your, your brother-in-law. How close were you to him? Well, Jack, uh, Jack was more like... Uh, a brother to me. I met Jack uh, back in the early 80s through my wife. Uh, uh, he married my wife's sister. They met at Fort Stewart when they were both at Fort Stewart. Jack, uh, as they said in this uh, video, is a combat medic in Vietnam and he stayed in the service for 22 years. He, he um, met my wife down, uh, my wife's sister down at Fort Stewart. And we became very, very close, very good friends. Um, I ended up uh, when I started uh, taking USO tours and going overseas and visiting our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, I would take Jack with me because uh, obviously he was uh, somebody who would really appreciate getting to, uh, to see our, our service members uh, in the, the current conflict. And I knew he would enjoy uh, being there and, and it would be something that I could give back to him. So. We were very, very close. Uh, unfortunately, he uh, was diagnosed with cancer in April of last year, and he died in October. It went very, very quickly. But uh, I learned a lot from him about service and uh, the Army, Vietnam, and a little bit about what it was like for him to be in service as a combat medic, although I'm probably going to learn a lot more today from General Bra Brady because my, my brother-in-law, he didn't talk a whole lot about it, but uh, um, I knew there was a lot going on in him, and I miss him very much. General Brady, um, talk about your crew. When you got a call to go out to evacuate people, what's the, who's the crew? Well, how's it made up? The, the crew on a dust-off helicopter was uh, four people, pilot, co-pilot, medic, and a crew chief, and it was a very, very tight-knit, tight-knit uh, team, we had to work together in all kinds of terrain and everything. I feel I feel like I know Jack too. He 
He was in Vietnam the same time I was. We were there. Uh, of course, you all remember Bob Hope and what he did for the troops when he came to Vietnam. I can't tell you what that meant to me and to the troops that I served with. And this next to me, Gary Sinise, is the Bob Hope of today. And what he does for those troops is just wonderful. Now, <clears throat> Jack was a medic. He was a combat medic. And the combat medic on our aircraft saw more traumatic amputations, sucking chest wounds, belly wounds, uh, probably than a lot of physicians. And they were very good in a very rough environment of uh, saving those lives. I, I'll just tell you uh, a vignette or two about a couple of the guys who did the same kinds of things. By the way, uh, uh, Jack died on my birthday last year, the 1st of October, and he was in my, the same battalion that I would later command in the 101st 326 Med Battalion when they were in Vietnam, so I do feel close to this kid. I had a medic, his name was Steve Hook, to give you an idea of a typical thing that a medic does in combat. We were called into an area, it was supposed to be secure. We've got some veterans Vietnam guys here? You know, you know what a secure area was? They would say, dust off, come on in, it's secure. <laughs> and so we get in there and uh, hit the ground and two uh, people popped out of spider, spider nest right beside the aircraft, shot my crew chief, shot my medic, Steve Hook. The crew chief was hanging in his harness, I thought he was dead. Hook, the medic, disappeared. And the guys on the ground went to, busy, went to work killing the, the snipers uh, that were right there next to us. And I'm looking for Hook. And uh, they said, get the hell out of here. So there was a kind of a little keyhole. So I pushed the aircraft forward into the keyhole. And there were 11 wounded. And I look around, and there's Hook, my medic, who shot, dragging the wounded to the aircraft. A lot of the, a lot of the friendlies wouldn't stand up to help him, and he's dragging 11 people onto the aircraft. He gets on, we're heavily loaded, and I look around, trying to get it out of that area, I look around, <clears throat> and Hook is going through the bodies in the back of the helicopter, treating him, but he's bleeding. He's shot in the back and he's bleeding, and I'm afraid he's gonna bleed out. So I grab one of the wounded, I'm trying to fly the aircraft with one hand, my co-pilot was having some problems, and shake one of the wounded guys and point to his first aid packet and say, and then point to the hole in Hook's back and say, plug it up. And so he's plugging up Hook while Hook is taking care of the, the patients. Now that's one example of what his brother-in-law went through on a daily basis in Vietnam. And I can tell you many, more, many, many stories about, these were my favorite human beings, the, the crew chief and the medic in Vietnam who was part of the team that we had that saved literally one million souls just in Vietnam alone. So he was a great, he, I know, I feel like I know him. I know he was a great person. I would have loved to meet him in person. You were obviously honored, uh, you know, when President Nixon bestowed the medal on you. What does that mean to you, reflecting on what you're describing right now? Well, you know, I was, I was actually embarrassed when I, you stand up there, there's people on the White House lawn, and, and you know very well that guys like Jack and guys like Hook and Pappy Coleman and the guys that flew with me, you know very, very well that they did everything that you did, and nobody saw it. And it's just that simple. The greatest thing about that award is that a bunch of your buddies saw it uh, appreciated it and took the time to put you in for it and so that you know you wear that for them that you know that sounds trite but it's absolutely true guy says I'm doing my duty all I'm doing is that's absolutely true except on some occasions somebody will see what you've done and will appreciate it and will take the time to write it up and that's that's how I got the Medal of Honor describe uh, once you go in once and you see what's on the ground, whether it's mines and it's explosions and getting shot at, and they have to crawl out of the medics, have to crawl out of the helicopter and do what you describe. 
Well, fine, maybe the first time, but when the bell rings the next time, what does it take to do it six, eight, ten times a day, day after day, week after week? Yeah, that's a trick. The the uh, guys will will oftentimes be very, very gung ho the first time in, and then the next time after they see what they've seen, you might have some problems. But we never had that problem with our medics and with our crew chiefs on the helicopters. These guys were saving lives, and and you know they would say, okay, <clears throat> we went in, the aircraft went in, he got shot up, uh, left. And then Dustoff went in after the other aircraft got, got shot up and got the patients out. Big deal. Well, guess what? The second mouse gets the cheese. And it's just that simple. The guys that would be shooting, by the time we got there, it was not that bad. We were able to go in using different flying techniques and be pretty secure about what we did. But the key, the key to the kind of people that we had with, there's no experience in the world that can match the experience of saving another human being's life. Nothing like it. I had an experience when I was a young kid, uh, swimming and another thing, and geez, it just, I just felt so good about it. In Vietnam, we did that day in and day out, saving lives, and so these guys, like Jack, Treese, and the Hook, and Coleman, and these guys, they were up every morning eager to go out and to rescue those people, to overcome the obstacles, to get around the enemy, to, 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 to get in that terrain or the weather or whatever the problem was, and to get that guy out and get him into a hospital where the, where the physician saved his life. That was, that was the fact. Where, where <clears throat> does the word fear come into any of this conversation? Oh, God. Fear is a horrible thing. But you, what you have to do is fear will cause to happen that which caused it. Just think about that. You didn't want to do My faith was a substitute for fear. I'm a Catholic. Uh, I was never afraid in combat. The, 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 the system that I used to get the Medal of Honor was the system the good Lord showed me flying in zero, zero weather in day. And the system I used to get the Distinguished Service Cross was a system that the good Lord showed me at night flying in weather as well. Fear is an emotion. Courage is a decision. Big difference between a guy who reacts under the emotion of fear when his life is on the line and the, li and the lives of the people around him are on the line. He is in, in a reaction mode. The guys like Jack Treese and Steve and the, guy, the guys that flew with me, that was a decision. They knew what they were going into. That is real courage when they will do that day in and day out. When you came back, you know, after your second tour, and Jack, you know, came back obviously around the same time, how were you received when you got back? Well, uh, it, you know, the, Viet the, the good thing about what happened to us in Vietnam is that America was kind of ashamed of the way they treated us, and they're treating the guy today uh, so much better. And you got guys like Gary going to take care of these kids. You got so many people who care about it. Now, having said that, the VA is not doing a very good job taking care of these guys. And you guys, and I'm going to tell the group, this, you need to get off your ass and get out and find people and elect people who are going to take care of this guy when he comes home. And that ain't enough. You got to take care of your buddy who's a veteran. <clears throat> And I told uh, David and anybody who would listen to me, uh, my daughter was in the invasion of Iraq. She was a second lieutenant. She was a medic just like I was. I've been almost dead a bunch of times, but I never went through what I went through when my little baby girl is in that invasion. I'm hearing through the media that they're being overrun. They're out of ammo, ambushed, all that bullshit until I could finally get to a, a television station that told me the truth, but I never went through anything like I went through. And so that, to me, said, my God, my wife, the families of all the veterans who were over there, just think what they went through. We didn't think about it when we were over there. The guys never thought about it. We never worried about it. But when I saw my little girl go, that, was, that brought home to me. So the other thing besides taking care of your buddies is taking care of those families as well. They sacrificed 
their youth so that liberty might grow old. And they've got widows and they've got people uh, that need our help. And as I said, we've been honored to death, for God's sakes. We need to take care of those like us who need our help and their families. You know, when so many of you came back and, and, and the media was on this, of course, like a hawk uh, during the Vietnam War, and calling the returning soldiers and airmen baby killers, what, what could you possibly say back to that if you heard that? Well, here's the way I looked at it. I, I didn't believe that was the American people speaking. I believe that was the media. And you don't want to get me started on the media. But I do believe, yeah, they, you know, they're supposed to tell us the truth about ourselves. They don't do that. They're so essential to our freedom. And they just don't really do their job. But I felt like what went on when we came back from Vietnam was a product of the media. We, we didn't, today the, the kids that go out and they're, they're welcomed and, and idolized, we kind of went underground, we went back to our jobs. We, I stayed in the military and, uh, and uh, although I hated it when I went in, I didn't want nothing to do with it, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I, I think the American people appreciate the Vietnam veteran and I know today because of the way they treated us, I feel this sincerely that they are treating this guy in a way that they will never be, will never be confused with the way they treated us in Vietnam. Yeah. Gary, as, as you listen to this, I'm thinking you've put your money where your mouth is. General Brady just said to all of us, we've got a job to do, to become part of solutions, not continuing to be part of the problem through not doing anything. You're doing it with your foundation. Tell me about the foundation, how you formed it, and, and what you're doing with it. Well, it, it's a you know it's an honor to be here with my friend uh, General Brady here. Um, I am very much motivated um, by what you just said, Pat, which is the Vietnam veterans in my family are the ones that really opened my eyes back as a young man. Now I have veterans on my side of the family. My uncle Jack, World War II, and my uh, my uncle Jerry was uh, on a ship in the Pacific in World War II. My dad was in the Navy. My grandfather was a, uh, he was an ambulance driver in France in World War I. But on my wife's side of the family, it was the Vietnam veterans who were just a little bit older than I when I graduated from high school and who I met um, because of my wife, who really opened my eyes and educated me quite a bit to what, our, what guys just a little bit older than I we're going through when I was uh, kind of uh, diddly bopping around and uh, playing guitar and and uh, chasing girls and things like that in high school. So when when that happened, when I got this education from meeting her brothers and Jack Treese, uh, her sister's husband, uh, a lot changed for me. And so I became very involved uh, early on uh, in this late 70s and 80s. Whoa. Sound of freedom. That's it. <laughs> so in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, I just got a real awakening there. Uh, Sound of freedom is still going on, isn't it? And that's great. And, um, and I got very involved with, uh, locally in, sh in the Chicago area with uh, local Vietnam veterans groups and worked with them from early 80s up until the mid 90s and then I played a Vietnam veteran in uh, Forrest Gump so I was I was I felt very prepared just very motivated when I got that part to to honor our Vietnam veterans and to do right by them by playing that particular character and then through that I got involved with the disabled American veterans because I played an injured veteran and I was introduced to the DAV, and that's that's big reason why I'm here today. They sponsor these concerts that I do, and I've been involved with them since uh, 1994. And then after September 11th, when we deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq, it felt that there was a, 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 a purpose for me uh, beyond staying home. 
And so I volunteered for the USO and got very involved with that and a lot of different military charities that were popping up in reaction to the attacks on September 11th. And then that manifested itself into my uh, own foundation, the Gary Sinise Foundation, and whose whole purpose is to serve and honor the needs of our military men and women, our first responders, those who protect and defend and provide our security and freedom for us, and those in need. And that's what the Gary Sinise Foundation is trying to do all around the country. So on a day-to-day -day basis, where, where, where do these commitments take you and the people who work with you? I mean, physically, where do you go? Uh, I'm, I'm constantly traveling. Uh, today I'm doing this veteran support concert here. Uh, last week I was somewhere, and the week before I was somewhere else. Um, so uh, we're doing quite a bit. You can learn about the foundation at GarySiniseFoundation.org. But one of the great things that has happened through the course of this post-9-11 uh, reaction and response is that I was connected with our Medal of Honor recipients and the Medal of Honor Foundation, and I'm on the President's Advisory Group for the Medal of Honor Foundation, and I have since become a national spokesperson for the Medal of Honor Museum that we're going to build in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. So I want to encourage everybody to go to Medal of Honor Museum, uh, org. It's the, it's the Medal of Honor Museum website. It'll completely key you in to what we're going. I think General, General Brady yeah. would probably want to talk a little bit about exactly. that. Exactly. General, yeah. tell us about the, it yeah, and why uh, it's important. You know, they, uh, they say that every so-called hero must at last become a bore. So all of those of us who are in the Medal of Honor Society, in order to keep be from becoming bores, have decided to do something. In the old days when we had, when we had conventions, uh, you would go there and we would party. And when you party with guys like Pappy Boyington, Commando Kelly, Scooter Burke, these are world-class partiers. <laughs> and we decided that, and Chief Childress, my God, I partied with him one night and I don't remember it. But we, we went to Philadelphia one time. And uh, the mayor there, Mayor Rendell, says, would you guys in the Medal of Honor Society, we have a convention in some city around the United States every year, would you go on a drug walk with us? Well, we didn't know what a drug walk was, but we walked through these urban or suburban or whatever, these neighborhoods, these downtrodden neighborhoods at night to show the drug dealers, I guess, that the mayor was there and that the Medal of Honor recipients were with him. And so the next day they said, well, why don't you go to a school? So we did. We went to a high school in Philadelphia and we had to go through metal detectors. And we thought, good Lord, you know, we have got to leave something behind besides a hangover. When we leave from now on and go to a place, we're going to do something else. So we developed our character development program. Gary's been instrumental on that. He's in our board. This is the, probably the finest, the most powerful board in the world. The, no, the people who are on that board are world-class American citizens who have created thousands and thousands of jobs and done great things for this country. And so through our character development program, we go into the schools across America and we teach children the importance of courage, source of success, sacrifice, a source of happiness, what a hero is, have to be a good person to be a hero, and what, a, what, a, what a America's nobility is and patriotism. And we use Medal of Honor vignettes to bring out these different points. And they're online, they're free, and you can get to them anytime you want. But the ultimate, the ultimate end of all this, we're gonna die. We're, we're, the average age of the Medal of Honor guy is 75 or something. We're gonna be dead in five or six years, almost all of us. There was 400 of them when I came in. Now there's about 79 of us left. We've got some young guys, but not enough. So this museum, is going to be a vault for our values. This museum is different than any other museum in America. It's not about a war. It's not about an army service. It's not about infantry armor. It's about all those things as represented by Medal of Honor recipients and the values that that medal represents. Medal, this medal, the other half token of this medal is courage, sacrifice, patriotism. That's going to be in that museum. 
And so that when a young man walks in the front of that museum and sees that Medal of Honor recipients, not only what they did in combat, but one of them's on Mount Rushmore. One of them was the first guy to fly with a gyro that opened up the airways for all the rest of us. This guy wrote taps. They did other things. And young people can do those same things in their life. They can be heroes in their life. And this is what we want, want them to take away. You go through this museum, one person, you come out the other end, a different person. Every one of us in our lifetime has met someone, somewhere, who made a difference in our life and made us what we are today. For me, it was the Christian Brothers of Ireland who just beat the shit out of me, and they finally straightened me out. But somewhere, somehow, somebody is going to make, and we hope that we, through our museum and through, we couldn't do it without guys like Gary. And uh, that's the end. That's my, that's my bucket list. And, uh, and if I die at the dedication of the museum, I'll be, I'll be happy. There are now a number of, yeah. Yeah. Um, There are now a number of young Medal of Honor recipients from Iraq and Afghanistan. What is their effect when you go around the country and appear publicly with these young men? What, what's the effect of them compared to, say, you? Yeah, they, they, the young people don't want to hear a lot from me. Yeah, I, 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 I'm too much like their parents and grandparents. But the, the young kids that are coming into society now, and I think there's only five or six, I haven't met them all. But the ones I've been with are real high-quality kids. And they are so important because a young person can communicate with them. I don't understand what's going on with these young people today, hardly, but they do. And so they can communicate with them, they know the technology, they understand what's going on in their minds and hearts and all that. So these young people are going to be jewels for the future of our character development program and our museum. And uh, so we're breaking them in, we're breaking them in, and, uh, and we're hoping that they follow in our footsteps. Gary, when you listen to uh, Pat talk about Jack Treese, your brother-in-law, and what he did, and you hear the details, how much of those details had you ever heard from Jack? Well, just just very few, actually. You know, uh, I would try to get him to talk about it, and he would always be very sort of matter of fact about it. You know, uh, and then you know, but I've I've read about some of the things that he's done, and uh, I know that he did a lot more than he was willing to kind of share. But he has, uh, you know, he and his his wife, my wife's uh, sister, had a son. His name's Gavin Treese. He's serving in the Army. He's done two tours in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and he's carrying on the tradition in the family as uh, somebody who's serving, serving in this current, current conflict. Uh, Jack was very proud of his son, I know. Uh, he was a quiet man, very reserved. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I wish I'd recorded him. Um, we have a wonderful uh, program at the National World War II Museum in, in New Orleans that my foundation is helping to sponsor because we're losing so many of those veterans. And we're sponsoring a historian to go out around the country and record oral histories of our World War II veterans. And, uh, you know, I'm doing that quite a bit as we did with my Uncle Jack, and I just wished that I'd sat down with my brother-in-law and talked to him more and gotten him to speak about it more. You talk about carrying on the family tradition. There was your Uncle Jack uh, flying B-17s as a navigator. How much did he talk? How much did he share? Well, he, he, he wouldn't be quiet. I could <laughs> 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 no, Uncle Jack, you know, I never, as a young man, it was really the Vietnam veteran side of my family that got me to kind of start thinking a lot about our veterans because by the time I was old enough, my Uncle Jack, my Uncle Jerry, my dad, my grandfather, they were all well beyond their service years. And so they didn't, you know, they didn't talk about it all that much. But after I started getting involved a lot with uh, military charities and USO and all of that, I just grabbed my Uncle Jack and made him go different places with me, like this trip uh, to, to take a ride on the B-17. Yeah, how'd you and all pull that, that off? How'd you surprise him? 
We ju I just told him I was going to play a concert in Texas, and I wanted him to come. And he said, oh, okay, I'll come. And um, then we, we really shocked him with the, it was all about getting him down there so we could give him a ride on a B-17. And that happened all through my contacts and friends of the DAV, Disabled American Veterans, who did that for my Uncle Jack and John Tennyson, who made this lovely film about him. And then just many, many times after that, I would take Uncle Jack, like I brought him here to Oshkosh. I, I took him to DC quite a bit to the National Memorial Day concert that I'm the co-host of every year. Uh, he got to, to come to that concert quite a bit. I would take him to the Medal of Honor events that we did at the Reagan Library out in, in Simi Valley. And he would just participate in a lot of things. And he looked so forward to traveling quite a bit. He traveled all the way up till he was 89 years old. The last trip he made was to Disney World, uh, where I narrate a show down there. And all he wanted, and we got him there on his birthday, which was uh, November 27th. And all he wanted was a picture of Mickey and Minnie <laughs> with him. That's what he wanted for his birthday. And I had a friend of mine who worked there. So I said, can you get me a picture with Mickey and Minnie? And he said, okay, show up here at 2.30. So we went and showed up at 2.30 at this little place. We went backstage, and the entire cast, 90 people from the parade, were all dressed up in their costumes and everything, and with a big sign, Happy 90th Birthday, Uncle Jack. And we went in there and uh, gave him a great time. And he, he had his picture, not only with Mickey and Minnie, but with the entire cast, and he died the following year. So he had 89 great years and a lot of fun on his last trip. Pat, the, um, it, we're talking about many veterans being unable to talk about their experiences. How useful is it to get all these messages out for veterans to try to talk more about their experiences to yeah. make more people aware? You know, uh, first of all, you, you guys all know I'm a helicopter pilot, right? In honor of Jack Sinise, I wore a fixed wing. The fixed wing weenies don't fly. We know that. They ride. You only really fly a helicopter. Both arms, both legs. So in honor of him, I wore this thing. And, uh, but my dad was a, a veteran. Uh, he was uh, with Darby's Rangers in World War II. And here, here's my take on it. I think that and we started a program up in Washington State at a veteran's hospital there where we call it a partner's program. And we would bring young people in from the schools and the veterans are in the beds there. And the, the kids would go into the room and talk to the veterans about their experiences. I wish that I had talked to my father about Darby's Rangers, North Africa, Sicily, Italy, but frankly, I didn't want anything to do with the military or nothing about it. And so, it, you know, it's like the guy said, we amputate our mem memories, we don't talk to each other about ourselves or our past. We need to do that. And my, my experience has been that these, these veterans are happy to share their experiences if somebody will just ask them. Just go up to your grandfather or your father who and say, hey, Dad, uh, how, what was it like there in North Africa? Uh, did you go up against Rommel? How about Sicily? How about Italy? And so he, the stories that I heard him tell were just jokes, you know, just robbing a bank so he could buy some oranges or something in Italy. But they are happy, and my, I believe that. There's nothing anybody does that there's to be what? There's nothing to be ashamed about. Nothing. Everybody has a problem with fear. But there's nothing that they, they should ever be ashamed of or afraid to talk about. Now, they see some horrible things, you know, that you really, you just can't get around that. But uh, you don't have to talk about that. Talk to them about the history of it. Talk to them about uh, the lessons it taught them, the brotherhood that goes on between them and their buddies. There's no closer relationship. I'm sorry, Nancy. That's my wife. She's back there. But there's no closer relationship, really, than what goes on uh, between two, between men in combat. You never, I can see a guy that we took us 38 years to find Pappy Coleman, just died recently. I walked up to him, it's like yesterday. The guy that I told you about, Hook, the shot in the back and the guy put the pad in it, he was, he was seriously hurt another time and, and almost a, by a, a miracle that I can't explain to this day. I found him, got him out. We see each other 
at least once a year. And uh, if we hadn't seen each other in 10 years, it wouldn't make any difference. It's the same feeling. And uh, one of the greatest honors of my life, really, was Pappy Coleman. This kid was shot three times, three, three Purple Hearts, three Silver Stars. He was with me on the Medal of Honor action. Uh, he was one time, he was shot right through the lips. Uh, they jumped on him and said, uh, Pappy, Pappy, he says, not to worry, I just kissed the bullet that had my name on it. Jumped up, back to get the patients in the minefield with me, his pants were on fire, he was almost blown through my rotor blades, back to get the patients. And I use him as, a, as an example of a good person. He left the Army with 18 years, 18 years. He could have been Sergeant Major of the Army to go home and take care of his family. He's a hero, not because of three silver stars. He's a hero because he's a good person. And that's what's important about heroism. But anyhow, uh, the great thrill was when he called me on his deathbed. Uh, and here I am, I'm watching my beloved Spurs kick Miami's ass. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call from him. He's on his deathbed, and he wants me to handle his funeral. Uh, he's now in the Aviation Hall of Fame. Uh, he's in the Dust Off Hall of Fame, marvelous human being. The only problem with it was they were burying him in Turkey Creek, Kentucky. They don't speak English in Turkey Creek, Kentucky. And to communicate with soldiers and to communicate with funeral people and to get bands and crap drove me nuts. But I was, I was happy to do it for Pappy, I guarantee you. So talk to him. Don't be afraid to talk to them. They're happy to, to tell you their experiences. Keep away from the, from the bad stuff, you know. Uh, I'm a guy that can't stand a needle, for God's sakes. I didn't think I would get through my first mission, but they did, I did, and uh, they're more than happy to share the, the, the experiences with you folks. Just ask them. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you are veterans? Yeah. Uh, when this when this program's over, over, all of you veterans, we have a young woman who will have challenge coins for all of you who are veterans. Also, Gary has to leave immediately to go do sound check for his band performance for tonight. Um, and we're going to take a picture with all the volunteers, by the way, who want pictures with the two. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Gary Sinise and General Patrick Brady. If we look it up here, we can see the nose, and that's, that's also the Norton bomb site, the famous Norton bomb site. And if you see over here on, to his right, the bombardier, there's a stick up there, and that's the controls for these two guns that, that we have in the chin. And as I said before, they were in there only on the G model, and that was to ward off the head-on attacks by the Germans. Now, the bomb site is famous for making these precision bombing, but it really was, it didn't work that well. So if you hit within a thousand, two thousand feet, you were lucky. Sometimes it, you missed it by a mile. So we, we really didn't have precision bombing, even though the papers said we did. If we come on further around here, you can see that this gun here, this gun here, that would be the navigators. He would grab that gun, which it didn't, it couldn't go with the range of this, of these two 50 calibers. And over there would be the bombardier if he was not manning these guns and wasn't flying the airplane, which he did on the final run, he would have those guns. If you come on over, that you look in here, that is where the navigator would be sitting, right there. He could sit out, he could look out through there. Through this hatch, when the, when the pilot and the co-pilot and the navigator and the bombardier got in the airplane, they would actually hope with that hatch, that ladder, they did not have a ladder. They would throw their parachutes in there, they would grab it, and they would just swing themselves up in the airplane. 
Okay, if we were making our walk around, these two scoops right here are the air scoops. That's for the, for the, goes through here, it goes through the turbocharger and into the engine. The turbocharger allows this engine, these engines are 1,200 horsepower. It allows these, this airplane to operate 25 to 30,000 feet. That was unusual in this day because this airplane first flew in 1935. So you have the, the scoops here and what we're looking for is to make sure nothing's in there. We don't have a duck or a bird or somebody threw a beer can or something of that effect in there. These are our engines, there's nine cylinders in it. It's 1,200 horsepower. There's over 100 horsepower in each one of those. those. It's a very reliable engine. The, the people that flew it during the Second World War, they thought this was probably the most dependable airplane that they'd ever flown. If you see the, the black over here, that was for the de-ice boots that they used. Sometimes they were on there, and some, most of the time they were off, they took them off. So we look in here, and by the way, this airplane, the average airplane that was over there, it was beat, the leading edge was beat up. This, this, this airplane is pristine compared to what they looked like when they flew them. So they, they were working on them as they flew their missions back, they were working on them, and it, they, were, they didn't care what they looked like. They just wanted to make, make sure that they were mechanically fine. So we look over at the gear. The, the gear on this airplane is electrical. The flaps are electrical. Everything in here is electrical except the brakes. The reason that is is because Boeing figured, and this, this was even in the B-29, that if you lost a hydraulic line, you were going to lose everything if it was all hydraulic. So they made it electrical to make it more simpler. So you have a backup system on the gear. If, if we lose the electric, if we cannot get it, drive it down. There's a crank up there, and we have a drive out, and you can crank that down with 269 turns. And I know that because I've cranked it down one time. Now, we're looking at the gear. We're looking to make sure that it's over center, looking for the general condition. The brakes on this thing are expander tube. It's like an inner tube with brake, brake pucks on the outside of it. And then you have hydraulic pressure that expands that, and that's how the brakes on it. The squealing that you hear on the movies is legitimate. You can still hear that when it taxes, it goes squeak, squeak, squeak. That's a, that's a B-17. This is called B-17 smuts. It comes out of the airplane. If you'll see one drip right there. If it's not dripping, then it's out of oil. It's supposed to drip a little oil. We don't, we don't really have a limit, but the, the, we would try to, if it burned over a gallon in an hour, we'd, try to, we'd, we'd find, try to find out what's the matter. On the, on the line, uh, you can change a cylinder on this airplane in about two hours. So it's a, it's a very dependable engine. And this is your exhaust. There used to be a shroud on here. They attempted to, to heat the airplane at one time, and it didn't work out so that there, there was no heat, there was no oxygen. They were flying at 25,000 feet. Some of their missions were eight hours long. The bum load, depending on how long, how far the, it was and how much fuel you had to put on. This, this airplane carries 1,700 gallons of fuel. These right up here, these are the oil cooler scoops. You can see them in there. Those, that right there is where one of the fuel pumps, and if there's fuel dripping out of there, you have a problem. If you look underneath here, if you want to get underneath here, Rich, and look underneath here, this is the turbocharger right there. This turbocharger, the, the exhaust comes through here and there's a turbine in here and it turns it just like it would a turbine in a, in a dam and it goes out here. That turbine has a, another turbine that actually compresses the air so that you can fly at higher altitudes. So that's a very important feature of this airplane. On, I don't know if these turbines work on this, this one. We had ours disabled because we didn't need them. We weren't going to fly from above 14,000 feet. Some of these airplanes still have them operational. We didn't. We had, we had dis disabled them. 
and you're looking, you're looking for this thing. You're looking for obvious leaks around here that are not there. I mean, we're supposed to, we get, we've got a little oil leaking out of here, but that's normal. So that's not a problem. So we come on around and we're looking to see if anybody put any, anything up there, a bird is flown in there. We're looking for, for leaks around the prop hub or right in here. That's, that's a very, it's a reliable prop, so we don't, you don't have much problem with it. Over here, that you've got your scoops, more, more your scoops over here. That, that is your air scoop for this engine right here. And that, our landing lights, and there, there you can see the, the boots over here. And this, it also has fabric controls on it. And as we said before on some of the other ones, that was for two reasons. Number one, because it was light. And secondly, because it could be repaired real easy. You just put a piece of what we would call duct tape now on it, and it's ready to go. Otherwise, if it was aluminum, you'd have to put an aluminum patch in there and rivet it and all that stuff. So that's why it operates that way. Now, this is that hatchet I was telling you about that's in the radio compartment. There was a, a 50 caliber machine gun that would slide out on a rack and he could come up here. Sometimes they took him out because the guy would get excited, he would shoot the damn tail off the airplane. So that's, so some of them didn't, ha didn't have that. And the B-17G, as far, as far as the guns are concerned, they're staggered. The other side is up here because they're, even though it looks big, you get inside of it, it's not big. So it's staggered so that one man wouldn't get in the way of the other one. The waste gun. And like I said, on the F model and the other earlier models, that was open and the guys were, were actually freezing to death. The earlier models had a blister up there with a stationary gun. And this, when I was talking about the dorsal fin, that's the dorsal fin, this part right here. The original ones, it came, the, the tail just went straight down. But that gives you a lot more stability. And let's see, tail wheel. There's not much you can say about the tail wheel. The tail wheel's retract retractable as the main gear is. So you got that. And we come on around and we'll, let's look. And it, the tail's kind of unique. The horizontal stabilizer is kind of unique in this that it's reversible. I can flip this, take this out, flip it over, and this would be the bottom on the other side and this would be the top. So that was so that interchangeability of parts. So on the, and this, this particular tail gun position on here is on the G model and the F model is a little different than the other ones. This has more of a greenhouse effect where he can see this gun sight, here's the gun sight, and this was in the latter stages of the war, it was a computer gun sight, it was a mechanical computer and they would, could crank in the altitude, and if, if they be being attacked by Focke Wolf 490s, they knew what the speeds were, they would crank that in, and that would give them an automatic lead when they were, when they were tracking the fighters. And these are your 250 McCallum machines gun. That's fabric, this is fabric. Those are static discharges that we have here. Of course, we've got lights out here. Those, those are formation lights. Now, you had other two, you got lights that, that were on the side that were formation lights. I can't imagine flying formation at night in this thing, but they did. And flight formation, they, it was important when they were flying in enemy territory that they be in very tight formation because they would usually have 12 of them in formation and that, that, that was 120 guns that was protecting that and the fighters respected that. But if there was a straggler, He's the one that got it. He was the impala that was behind the herd. So they would pick on him. And this, this door here is where the, the waste gunners, the, the uh, ball turret gunner, and, and may, maybe the engineer, but the, the uh, tail gunner, that's where they would come in. And they, they had their chutes, and all of them wore their, most of them wore their chutes except, or had their chutes real close by where they could snap them on, except the ball turret gunner. He had to leave his out. If they had problems, 
Somebody had to crank him out of there and get him out and put that on. So that, it, to my mind, other than being claustrophobic, that, that would drive me nuts, worried about somebody getting me out of that thing. But that takes us back to the wing route. Of course, these engines are the same, and uh, that, that completes our walk around.